What is your relationship with truth? What is your deepest value, which includes all your other values? What are the questions you want to think about, investigate, that you don't know the answer to, but that you want to find the answer to? I will be asking Islam Hakim. He is a newcomer to Math for Wisdom, a new leader uh, of our new study group on the landscape of truth. I'm very uh, delighted to be getting to know Islam, and you will too. I am Andrus Kulikowskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Yay. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Peace be upon you all. Welcome. Yeah, it's uh, it's really a pleasure to, to be here and pleasure to interact and contribute and find like-minded people who are mathematically uh, uh, competent and able to not just do the math in its own nat normal domain, but also to extend it to the more natural domain of uh, applying it to the wider life and thought and using it as and beyond analogy. So, yeah, it's exciting times. And so... um. I'll just add, I, I, I agree, and but I add that like mathematics by nature is, uh, because it sprawls out in so many different directions um, and people have championed that and so boldly, um, that most of the time I, and I think most everybody, uh, thinks of ourselves as, you know, ignorant fools <laughs> or simply mm. just wondering. So it is very, uh, it's something that... Um, if you know it, then it becomes a language you can share and speak. But but one of the major uh, maybe things we share is how much we don't know. And also, it's a uh, very I think interesting that, point. If I pick up on that one, is, yes. is um, it's kind of like the relativity of ignorance is related to the relativity of wisdom. It, there is a definitely a sense in which you're not more ignorant when you've gained a huge amount of uh, um, knowledge on maths by doing a PhD, right? But at the same time, you're also aware of far more holes than you were ever knew before in your knowledge. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you've increased your ignorance, right? And <laughs> so it's a it's, it's an interesting paradox. You almost have to sort of define, uh, um, you know, what your what your frame of reference is compared to other people for any given scenario um, on that stuff. So it's interesting. And so um, those distinctions become more clear between what we know and what we don't know, uh, which actually is a theme in terms of these uh, three minds, a mind that knows the answers, a mind that uh, doesn't know but asks questions, and the third mind that has to sort those out, investigate, you know, balance those two and choose maybe one or the other as appropriate. So um, uh, this practice with mathematics also... Um, lets us, uh, and, you know, the ancient Greeks notices, but it lets us actually uh, think deeper about wisdom, you know, like in the sense mm -hmm. mathematics is almost like a shadow of wisdom. So um, I'll ask Islam, how would you like to present yourself? Um, so uh, I'm a human being, okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> like, human being, a Muslim, um, probably identify in that order, perhaps maybe the other one other way around um my you know passions in life are to do with um being a good person whatever in in the broadest not the broadest sense but in 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 dimensions that are meaningful to me and some of that means being sort of practically capable to people so being able to apply knowledge but part of it is also you know learning and gaining knowledge and having the knowledge to be able to give to someone in their time of need or when they want that or maybe even they don't know they need that knowledge like you can you know <laughs> turn up and just help <laughs> you know um mm -hmm. so in one way or another there's some element of being useful for me attached to the kind of values uh, if that makes sense it's almost like a checksum of whether it's truly valuable or, or sort of navel gazing and that's a theme in my life very much that uh, like since childhood i wanted to know everything but i understood intuited uh, realize that it has to go hand in hand with applying that knowledge usefully. So mm -hmm. just like exactly, I think what you're saying in your life, you defined yourself as a Muslim. And so I'm curious how, uh, what, what could you say more about that? What does that mean? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, a little bit of background just for, for context. So I was, um, adopted, uh, but I was you know born in the UK. Um, I was raised by, uh, 
a, a mother with sort of Catholic origins and a father who was very atheist in a Church of England school. Um, and then I left sort of Christianity fairly early on in my life. I was a very staunch atheist, very argumentative, very sort of learned atheist, uh, if you like. Um, right the way up until I got into university and ended up I was studying theoretical physics. And uh, one of my peers I was Muslim and I was just talking to him, how on earth can you believe in God and also be doing maths and technical things? How does that work? It was, you know, um, for, for me, it had always been the people uh, um, to do with their technical level. Like if they had a high technical level, they were generally atheist. If they had a low technical level, they might may or may not be. So um, going into those conversations and like really understanding why I think was quite profound. I think one of the main sort of points that just sort of hit me so directly was in arabic it, it's quite clear with the language that they call god allah which is the god because al is a definite article mm. and my conception of god that i'd always had and been raised with was like one of several options like it didn't really have a truly monotheistic concept and therefore everything i'd argued was shadow boxing with a straw man mm -hmm. and also then the scientist in me was like well, if I'm going to stand on whatever day and say, I believe in science, well, I haven't done the experiment. You know, I haven't taken on this concept into my mind and run it through and see if it mm -hmm. is better. And so I was checkmated. I, I, I had to take it. It's interesting because a lot of people sort of come to religion through some kind of profound emotional experience or something like that. But I was in many ways quite opposite. I was just, I found myself checkmated and just had to almost begrudgingly accept at the time, not even almost, uh, that it was true and then sort of realign my whole sort of brain and reality and life to to that fact. Um, and so uh, you described it a bit, but was would you say that's a logical checkmate or an existential checkmate or in what oh, sense? It was both. It was, it was both, yeah. And it's partly related to my autism because part of how I'd always defined myself was um and being you know consistent with striving for the truth like you know if i'm if mm. i'm it's almost like my only armor like because people never sort of seem to like or appreciate my ways of thinking or what i'm doing mm. as, as a, someone who thinks very differently it's you know um but if it's true i can say it you know <laughs> um or at least i've got some good defense so it had always been as essential in that sense in the social context um, and it also becomes sort of one of my defining characteristics that I was the very academic geeky one who mm -hmm. not knows everything, but has a good chance of or will know something about it or, will, mm -hmm. you know, that was part of my sort of value as well. So, but to, I, I realized I haven't quite tied it back to answering your question. What does Muslim mean? I was kind of, you know, leading into that. Um, and it's this, it, it is what you're saying about this sort of checkmated. Um, it's interesting because, you know, is, Islam means submission but in a very peaceful way, like very willingly submission. Um, and a Muslim is one who is submitted to God. Um, so that's what it means. And that's what it means to me. So anyone for me who who passes that first bar would be linguistically Muslim, but not uh, technically Muslim, because the, the second axiom is belief that Muhammad is the messenger from God. And those two axioms are necessary and sufficient for one to become Muslim. I really like the way it's so cleanly axiomatic and just, you know, before William Ockham realized his razor is just just such an efficient system of branching from a single axiom to a pair of axioms to, to the whole sort of thing. So there's a lot of different um, ways of looking at that question. I think we could end up on that topic forever, honestly. <laughs> well, I think we can return to that, but I think that's yeah. a good um and maybe just to say, we have a small community math wisdom, but for example, uh, Aslam Kakar uh, just uh, successfully defended um, his uh, PhD in global affairs at Rutgers University. Yeah, so we'll, we'll be celebrating. Um, but um, he uh, leads the Pashtun Studies Institute. He's from um, northern Pakistan, you know, a village mm -hmm. uh, where he lived without shoes. And... Um, uh, his father died when he was two years old. And, and so the fact that he was able to go on this academic journey, you know, just says a lot about his uh, character, his family's uh, support. But he went in an opposite direction. So he uh, he grew up in an in a Islamic environment, right, where people have submitted to uh, Allah, mm -hmm. God. And uh, he found that very uh, problematic. I think I'd let him talk more about that. But... Um, 
So I think he would describe himself as as uh, not a theist, maybe even an atheist, uh, mm. in some kind of enlightened sense. I think for surely, but I think that uh, um, uh, maybe, and maybe to say, our way of interacting in math wisdom isn't really about what we know, because that's this one mind that we're trying to kind of like pull away from. And not even so much what we don't know, but the relationship between the two. And so yeah, one of the yeah. questions, so I'll be asking about your questions, but one of his questions is like, how can the extremist way of thinking be countered with a critical way of thinking? So see, now we have two people with maybe kind of like uh, almost opposing points of view, but I think it would be very sympathetic and be able to really work together and help us get inside. I, I think I'm I'm quite excited by the bridge building opportunity there because like I say, he's sort of gone to where I was and I went to <laughs> something like where he was. It's almost like a you know an electron and a positron swapping spaces. Right. Or but uh, uh, I think I I don't know what he left because there right. are you know versions let's say that are in culturally normal in pakistan that might not be you know what i would recognize as islam over here or maybe i would recognize it but i would say you know the things he disliked actually i would also dislike and not regard to be part of the religion so those those would be interesting conversations but those also have been done in sort of many ways i think well, the and, fact well, that and he's so very I, I think I think that the fact that he's very interested in uh, you know the mathematics and the math of wisdom side and the sort of collective binding together of knowledge that's what makes it interesting to try and build that sort of bridge um, and and see and, what we've got there. So, so that's uh, a yeah. language for bridge. You also mentioned um, that you're autist. Now I have my own theory about autism, so which is you know just a very toy theory. But uh, I'm curious, why would you think you are autist, Dick? You know what oh, makes you well, think that. Yeah, so I mean, um, I would actually, I sort of say that as a simplification. Uh, I actually have a range of neurodiverse mm -hmm. traits and characteristics. They're just kind of easier summed up that way. I mean, when you've had three qualified psychotherapists tell you straight that that's the fact about you, um, that is sort of, you know. Okay, so I'll tell you, I'll was. tell you. But my... then also I had um, my my uh, boss um, was, was mm -hmm. also neurodiverse. And he worked with me when in neurodiversity, saying like, "Look, I know, I know this. Um, I know how to work with you because of this autism. I have it too." And and so, I, a lot of my colleagues have been kind of supportive. Uh, or, you but know, what would be the main symptom? Of that, what would some be of the main symptom of that? Well, this is the thing. I mean, I I would first of all even retract from the language of symptoms because for me, it's it's a it's a difference of thinking. It's not a a disability right it, it, it just means so, the cognition goes differently so for way? example so for example um uh if i tell you about mine rather than the general theory of it if i tell you about mine so um overly sensitive and perceptive hearing is one of them um a brain that fires in many many different kind of directions and it's very hard to kind of wrestle and keep on one sort of line of focus um is is uh another one um my, my general social ineptitude um everything i'm I, I, I've become learned. I, you know, I, I had to learn how to socialize, and it's a very learned okay. thing. Um, and uh, I mean, even to the extent. So when I, when I used to do, uh, sorry, well, I still work in cybersecurity, but I used to be a professional penetration tester. Part of that also included social engineering. So having this this sort of facility of autistic masking, right? It's kind of if you don't get to understand and work with autistic masking, it is quite debilitating. But if you understand it, it can be a really useful tool. So I could just so, basically throw up a, a a mask and and use it to do social engineering and then throw it away. Um, so that's so, something. That's so I want to fun. ask. Um, I want to ask about uh, just to have the opportunity. This is completely a side thing, but uh, I have this theory um, that, um, and this is based when I was in eighth grade a uh, long time ago. I we were told in a social science class about a video which was made by an anthropologist in an American kitchen. You know, it was just a little snippet, 90 seconds. Mm. He studied it for three months, trying to figure out what are the people doing? But basically he played it slow motion. And he said, oh, it looks like the mother, father, child are dancing. You see, if you play in slow motion, like, you know, the one reaches for the cabinet, the other ones kind of move, and it's all balanced and choreographed. 
So mm. there's like a sixth sense that most people have, which and I think was very important in human evolution uh, for the development of a joint intentionality, which Tomasello talks about. So this idea that really what made us human was, you know, like chimpanzees can have teams to hunt, let's say, a monkey as prey, you know, and one goes up above the trees and one goes down and they all have their different ways of attacking. But they all think that's going to be my monkey, you see, mm. whereas humans are able to have a team on the fly and they understand that this is a joint venture. They will share the monkey, you know, et cetera. But like someone who wasn't on the team is not going to get the monkey. Like, so, but we're, they're able to do it, like just form new teams at any moment to do something like that. You need, uh, it's very helpful to have this sixth sense where you physically bodily immediately tune into each other, or maybe like singing in unison, these types of things. So I think Would you call I, I social, like, uh, sort of detecting uh, um, social status, a sixth sense. Would would that be an example? Well, it's one? a six, It's not even social status. It's just it's just a matter of gluing together as a team. So, uh -huh, okay, I normal see. people like if if you look at a photograph, mm. look at a random photograph of people. They all look harmoniously balanced. You see, mm. look at a photo of chimpanzees. They just look like they're all in their own world. You see, mm -hmm. so autistic people. They don't have that sixth sense. They look like the chimpanzees are just kind of like they're not connected to other people. Then, therefore, there are lots of consequences, which means mm -hmm. you're socially inept. You just don't connect to people. You are alone. If it happens to be, you know, with other, you know, if you're if you're mentally damaged, then you're just all the more worse. Otherwise, you have to compensate, etc. But the point being, the idea being that, like, if it's just this is the root, you see, that explains a lot of things because it could be genetic. But it could be from trauma. You see, it's just like yeah, being it's, blind. It's interesting. It's very you could be partially to... blind or totally blind. But does that sound real? Does that sound on yeah, target? Yeah, well, I mean, this it's it's very closely related to the way I think of it. Although I wouldn't, I don't label it so much as a sixth sense. I I think um, that there is something which is genetic, but also could be trauma triggered. And I don't think the genetic is required to cause this artifact. And the artifact is something which changes the manner and frequency in which the brain updates in response to social and emotional signals. And so I think what you actually find is that um, most people will adapt to the surrounding society naturally with their brains. And I think autistic people will adapt less. Um, and or so they end up more in their own world. And that's one of the reasons I think like when someone manages to hang on and be valuable and connected socially into that world, like, you know, Newton and Maxwell and so on, you end up with then this incredibly profound connections between a whole different way of viewing reality and the rest of the social masses. And I think that's where we get what's regarded as being sort of, you know, quantum shifts in the understanding uh, of, of sort of, you know, matter and things like that as, as an example so there's there's so, benefits in it there's blessing in it you know it, it's not just a, a, a so negative thing the, just understanding it in terms of the blessings um this idea of uh this theme of neural diversity i think that you've mentioned you know or neural relativity etc yes that relativity. is that is very uh a great contribution uh it's just turning out practically like when i think of math for wisdom i think of our study groups like I have to act socially or think socially, like with all the leaders, it's very different. You see, some mm -hmm. are old, some are young, like, so that's very curious. But now, like you're saying, okay, you have practice with this neurodiversity, you see that, and you also have the ability to kind of detach from what's the normal, quote unquote, and, and see, mm -hmm. okay, let's take a look at this, you know, more objectively. Uh, mm -hmm. So as a leader it's of the interesting. I just wanted to, just before we get to that question, something I wanted to add to that, because uh, I only go into a fraction of the sort of characteristics mm -hmm. that i have one of them that's important to mention and it's this is like a, a, a just purely a gift from god is um an ability to visualize things not just sort of like a 3d cad landscape but like i can visualize four dimensional rotations and and shapes wow. and movements on them and things like that with, without any issue i can draw them on a whiteboard um five dimensional even sort of but not mm -hmm. as clearly um and but but also i like every thought and concept that is not purely emotional that like that has some logical or, or that i can pass through the frontal cortex 
has mm. some kind of form or shape or topology associated with it, which is kind of like you can think of sort of sheets of things and and uh, like networks over them and stuff like that. Um, but they can be sometimes very complex forms that look like sort of clouds and they can sometimes be very simple forms or very clean forms and all this sort of stuff. And they sort of flash in and go out, but they also bear similarity to the forms that I see um, much more in a sustained manner. If I close my eyes, then the I can sort of see because my my eyes are so sensitive, like the rest of the, the everything's so sensitive. Um, most people, when they close their eyes, is it's either black or there's like a faint fuzz. Mm -hmm. But for me, that faint fuzz is extremely vivid. And mm. I can see almost like the cosmic microwave background or, or like the waves crashing on the shore. I can see remnants of all sorts of activity that's gone in my head. And mm. through comparing like what I see in trauma and non-trauma events and through like grand realizations and things, mm. like, I can sort of start to get an understanding of, of like what those things on the back of your eyes sort of mean for the brain. You can almost even meditatively sort of put it in a feedback loop and get it to just try and learn without telling you if you know what I mean. Um, a, a so little, anyway, that, I mean, that you're bringing stuff, things back I'm... from childhood, you know, that, uh, <laughs> that were forgotten. <laughs> you're kind of dragging them out. So, wow. Well, but so, the reason but I, I mentioned that is because obviously those concepts then become the ones that I base my understanding of mathematics on. So mm -hmm. then when I speak to someone about mathematics, I'm always interested in, OK, if you were to think of that as a graph or as a topological structure, like how would that work or how would that be? And that's sort of my most sort of fundamental way of making connections with other people's thinking is like, what's your thought structure compared to my thought structure? So this is um, these are superpowers. We're superheroes, and we're going to you know, we're writing, look, always looking for more. But uh, so this will be a topic we will delve into. And now um, you've defined yourself in different ways, and so now we're going to try to put you in the straight jacket of math wisdom to see how comfortable it could be. But so maybe I'll start asking then: uh, What is your relationship with truth? Yeah. Um... Firstly, one of love. <laughs> um, and the reason I say that is because using my current understanding of truth is um, the, again, the Arabic word al-haq, which means the truth. Um, and that's one of the 99 names and attributes of Allah, who I mentioned earlier. So they're actually sort of synonyms in a sense, like one, one implies the other. Um, I think I described them to you before as you can think of them almost as points on a surface that are sort of connected into a non-house door space. And so you can kind of have these distinct labels to refer to it. But the thing you're actually referring to is a, a non-house door bundle of those things, meaning you can't distinguish one from the other in reality. Right. House door um, would mean that there's like local neighborhoods that you can uh, separate them but right, so how, not that, necessarily. There may not. Yeah, be how, house door space is a separate one. That's like almost all manifolds you deal with in physics and everything else is is house door because they're they're you can do things with them. But as soon as it's non house door, um, you can't distinguish two points. So you can't even have a metric. You know, um, they're yeah. House, they're, house they're sometimes pathological, can, but they're very interesting can, spaces. House door kind of says like when there's points, you can kind of categorize them by having little right. shells around them, little neighborhoods. Yeah. So it allows you to kind of switch over to this categorical mind. Uh, but you're saying mm -hmm. that there may not be that, uh, that. I think the element I was getting to in the analogy was the indistinguishability feature, really. Mm -hmm. um, it was that because uh, because what I wanted to not do is give a concept of parthood of God. Right. So I don't think of God as consisting 99 parts, which have these names. Right. Their attributes to point into a consistent connected whole and the differentiations are for the purposes of my limited mind to try and connect to him. Right. Um, so the and it was it was truth, as I mentioned before, that sort of drove me into the arms of of uh, the Quran and Sunnah into Islam in, in, in the first place. Um, and then um, I've got to make sure I stay on topic and don't bleed into the other questions. Well, let me just repeat the question, but to say so. And this isn't so much about your understanding of truth, but more your relationship with truth. What is truth for you? You're right. So, so, so it is it is so the truth, the absolute truth is this uh, um, feature of God. So I love it. I respect it. I want to go towards it. I want to be more consistent with it. I want to be more consuming of it. I want it to be one of the doors to paradise that's open to me, um, along with his mercy and the other ones that I hope are open to me. Um, and it's one that I seem to have been sort of tailor made to look at like if the, whatever i do with my life tends to fail unless it's something related to a search not for 
the truth in its totality because i believe only god can have that but to have access to to deeper and deeper alignments with truth on in broader and broader surfaces of interface with other people and other things in creation so truth is something you want to go towards that would yeah be it's it's an objective yeah i think i said target sometimes and but objective well, is really... I, I kind of offer target but you said objective yeah mm -hmm. we talked a week but... ago you know and i was very impressed that you've you know in your life you've thought about this a lot and it's kind of mm. uh, clarified and uh and uh you you have yeah. so so it's an objective, an objective or I, I never the objective or you want to get closer to you want to go towards it it's you can think of it like an asymptote like i never expect to actually reach that summit um mm. you know the, this side of the grave um but i don't want to be going away from that direction because that's a direction that's towards god and it's a direction that i feel i have tools to stay on track with um, so i would say it, like truth is an asymptotic objective i want to go towards yeah yeah like that. that's all right yeah. okay yeah, yeah. Um, but the thing is, it gets complicated because I do, there are different notions of truth that we conflate or that English language conflates mm -hmm. and it's hard to deconflate them. I classically, I, I often say, okay, triangle has three sides. Mm -hmm. There's a sense in which that's a truth, right? But there's also an obvious sense in which it's merely a definition. And mm -hmm. so I think it's important to distinguish between things that are true by definition and things that are true by consequential connection with reality. And it's like if a definition survives consequential connection with reality and is useful in lots of places, it becomes a useful concept. People adopt into broader and broader uh, frameworks of thinking. And so uh, you'll be you are leading um, the Math for Wisdom study group for the landscape of truth. Uh, we've already collected answers from maybe 30 different people on this question and on um the next one, which is, you know, what is your deepest value in life, which includes all your other values. But just to say that um, we're finding, you know, that people are all unique, which is fantastic. Kind of like those points on your uh, non-Hausdorff sphere or whatever, mm -hmm. the names of Allah, you know. Um, but um, marvelous names. Um, but um, that um, there are some commonalities. So like you said, in terms of this correspondence, whether it is truth by definition, you know, or whether it is truth with reality, but there's different places where you have this correspondence between the content and the form, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll go into that. But maybe now I ask you, what is your deepest value in life, which includes all your other values? Yeah, well, um, in, a, in a nutshell, it is my name. Islam Hakim is my deepest value. And that was at the end of a journey, um, which went through Haq truth to hakim which means wisdom so islam hakim um is probably best translated as uh willingly submitted to wisdom uh but because you can't take one of allah's names your own name so i couldn't say al hakim right so yeah. the the but the implication is obviously that it's it's his his greatest wisdom and, and that's who i want to learn from and and, and be part of and all this not part of, sorry not not part of you know be part of of, of the the creation he's made that's what I meant to say. And so in English, that would be the translation, willingly submitted to wisdom. Is that? Is yeah, that... it's just that it it kind of carries the implication to the most wise. And I could that could be a capital W, right? I mean, like this yeah, is, a, yeah. that would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could say it's just willingly anyone. submitted to the most wise. <laughs> not just my it's grandmother. Just I couldn't wisdom. actually put the most wise in my name because you can't have a human being taking on others' names. So that's why it's, it has its structure. It could be we could write it that way, willingly submitted to the most wise. Or with yeah, 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 would that yeah. be better? Or well, I, I think it it it's much less dangerous in English than Arabic. <laughs> um, but uh I what's I think your I'm preference, sir? Mm -hmm. Uh well I I'd say just it's uh, wisdom or or to yeah, with a capital or, or W. The, or the, the source of wisdom. I think that avoids the ambiguities. To the source of wisdom. Right. Yeah. Willingly submitted to the source of wisdom. Mm. And see, this is um, that is actually very interesting because uh, these things we've discovered like are very tightly related. Your um, relationship with truth and the deepest value where um, the con it's like 
there's this landscape of truth, of correspondence between these two minds, the mind that knows, the mind that does not know, and then there's uh, consciousness, which is trying to navigate that. And so there's this landscape of truth, like there's beauty, good truth is one of the uh, classic uh, collections of virtues. So think of like, I think of like beauty as what is attractive to the unconscious, you know, mm. and the goodness is this logical kind of goodness that's attracted, you know, that the conscious, but truth is what consciousness, you know, values is when your sweetheart is beautiful because she's you know, good and it kind of all connects. There's this harmony between the beauty and the good, let's say. That's just- Do you include, uh, do you include your heart in the evaluation of truth or were you excluding that as a separate thing? Well, that that would be part. I mean, the heart. You know, there's this relationship between the unconscious and the conscious, so that certainly involves the emotions and the heart and etc. You know, the emotions mm. coming from the. And so then, if you're looking at that, the consciousness has to, you know, listen to that. You know, work with that. It's um, interesting you should say that. I it just I thought that was an interesting minor differential we have. Where for me, I actually use, or maybe not so minor. I I use my heart as part of my heuristic mechanism for. Sure, so I would. I'm aligned with with the truth. So. Well, okay, so we'll talk about that. I mean, I would, mm. I would too, and so, um, the emotional life is what the unconscious wants to say to the conscious. That's the language. And so mm. if you're just looking at that direction between them, you know, you could get rid of the unconscious and you could get rid of the conscious, but that language would persist, let's say. Those mm. things have meaning, right? Like, even if, so, um, and vice versa with cognition, you know, it's trying to, the conscious is trying to impose. Um, what I wanted to say here was that uh, if you have this notion of truth, like you're located, you know, where are you connecting these things? Well, your truth is, your relation with truth is that you've, as what is an asymptotic objective you want to go towards. Well, if God, you know, looks through that, right? If God mm -hmm. looks through you as a lens, trying to empathize with human being, then the love of God, you know, would, would the spirit of truth in God would say, well, you know, you're willingly submitted to the source of wisdom. And it's also interesting, like, Wisdom then becomes an asymptotic thing because it's the source that matters, yes, right? So, yes, and it's and the and wisdom it's, is just kind of like you know you yeah. can get wisdom, but you're not getting any really to the source. You're just but wisdom is what is bringing you to the source. So it also kind of gives you gives a kind of way to think about wisdom. The last thing I want to ask you, and we have about five minutes, and then I'll ask you to end us with a prayer. So before that, I want to ask you. So what are the questions you'd like to investigate? Um, at Math for Wisdom, or just in general, what what are things you don't know about? Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, knowing lots of things for me isn't really the same thing as having real knowledge, right? These, mm -hmm. these are snippets. So I, I tend to be very careful to say, I know I read that in this book. I know mm -hmm. this person said that in this era because I have the book and I've I read it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something I can I can claim, but I I don't tend to. Or, or mean to imply that I know the nature of an electron, for example. I, I sort of, I don't like to operate on that kind of space. So mm -hmm. for me, um, there's really that the landscape of, of truth is much more about where the consistencies are between the things that are, you know, the consistent and positive looking, positive looking towards the goodness, towards the truth. Those are the intersections that I'm interested in. Um, so in the same way as you might build up an atlas using differential geometry with lots of different coordinate patches, that's how I think of, uh, uh, um, you know, building up maps of the landscape of truth. And you can do them at different hierarchies, different abstraction levels. So how, how would you, you think... phrase that as a question or one or more questions? Right. So, so the, the, the overarching or, you know, question... In terms of your particular interests, right? Like in terms of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so the question is, how does this patchwork come together? Right. How? how how does one what's the optimal patchwork in order to connect with people for good um you know how does it really work um do other people see this or do you have to have a particular kind of brain to for this to make sense um there, there's all sorts of related questions but so they, one, one way or another slow... they oh sorry go on just to slow you down what is the optimal patchwork of knowledge you're talking about knowledge mm. is that right or Yes, and I don't think there's one overarching optimal. It's more like how does one go through their life and build the optimum for them? So it's it's about teaching 
I'm trying to learn how to fish to teach people how to fish. Okay, so how do we personally build optimal patchworks, our optimal patchworks of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. And then... But it's not just it's not just knowledge. I think that the thing is what I wanted to differentiate is knowledge from the perspective on it or the way it's presented. It's almost like in representation theory, right? You can have many different representations of the same underlying group. It's like the underlying group is the knowledge. Well, what if we said what if we said, speak in representation? What if we said truths instead of knowledge, right? Optimal patchwork of truths. That's it, because really the the the, the patchwork work is in the dialectic layers it's in the ways that people um it, it's almost like the, the again that the analogy is important that the the groups themselves like live in people's heads and they can only communicate using representations but do you have compatible representations and have you set up your spaces in compatible ways that's the underlying uh, um sort of uh, uh thing that you need to sort of have to be able to move on this quest of collectively building a truth because this is the thing, right? As much as you do this as an individual, you have to, what you really want to be able to do is to be able to do it individually in a way that you can also combine collectively. And that was so the original. That, so I'm saying design, like, to, but, to phrase uh, the question, over. how do we personally build our systems of knowledge to collectively, to contribute to collective truth? Or collective truth alignment or optimizing truth alignment. Yeah. Truth How do we personally build our systems of knowledge to contribute to optimally aligned collective truth? Or... That works. I think that works. Yeah. Yeah. I, feel, I, I do struggle with the, the one line of summaries and you are very good at them. So, uh, no, I think I, I think that works. It's, it's definitely a good working definition. We can sort of yeah, we start forward. and then you can. Yeah. Yeah. OK, well, that's a lot. You, I know you'll have more questions. We have one from you. <laughs> Would you end us with a prayer? Yeah, sure. Um, oh, Lord of all the worlds, creator of us, most merciful, uh, most beneficent, please bless all of our endeavors. Please guide us to truth, to wisdom, and submit us to your glory, majesty, and wonder, and uh, admit us to your paradise. Right. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm John Harlan. I lead the physics study group for Math for Wisdom. I'm a Patreon supporter of Math for Wisdom because of the useful conversations I have to get the wide perspective that Math for Wisdom offers me from Andrews and the other participants. Uh, and I uh, want to keep these conversations going, so I'm a supporter.